All right, guys. So this video here I want to do uh, basically is a Q&A to catch up, uh, you know, basically on the, the questions that keep coming up from the past eight videos. So uh, basically, some of you may or may have not noticed uh, in the videos, there's actually quite a lapse, uh, you know, back in time. Today happens to be November the 7th. Uh, what you guys are seeing are about two months behind. Uh, and basically what this is, I started this project in about mid-April and uh, basically due to work and just uh, trying to get materials and everything else, I wasn't sure if I could uh, produce enough content in a week to make a video. So that's why you guys are seeing kind of a delay in everything. I was just making sure that I could, uh, you know, kind of keep getting these videos out consistently. So anyway, what I want to do is just I want to go through and just kind of share with you, uh, you know, kind of a more in-depth, uh, you know, Q&A rather than the videos. So the boat, uh, I, I'll show you the boat at the end of the video, but uh, it's it's about 95% completed as far as the fabrication is concerned. Uh, I've just got just a few little things here and there, and then just a bunch of final grinding and cleanup and everything. But for the most part, the boat's essentially done. Uh, so it's been a pretty lengthy project, you know So anyway, uh, we'll jump right into this Q&A here I don't want to make this video too awful long, but uh, I'd like to cover you know some of the the questions that continue to keep coming up because You know making these videos is it, it's actually fairly difficult uh, to To make the video in a timely length and then also kind of keep the storyline going uh, You know, I've got realistically probably a couple hundred hours of footage that uh you know we'll never even see see a youtube video strictly because you know i can sit here and talk about one thing for eight ten minutes at a time you know and and if you were to put that into a video you know it just beats too long and drawn out that uh nobody would watch it so there are a few things that are you know i can understand that kind of come up as questions that i may have missed so anyway we'll just jump right into it um I will say I've had a lot of questions about my welding setup. Uh, so at the end of the video, I'll jump down out of the boat here and uh, and I'll just share with you guys what I'm using actually to uh, put this boat together. So anyway, uh, basically I'm just gonna walk over the specs of this boat one more time because I think uh, you know I, I keep jumping around in the video. So this boat here is right around 25 foot long. It's like 24 feet 10 inches long. Uh, it's got a uh, 85 and a half inch beam across the bottom and in the front we're just a hair over uh, six foot we're about 74 inches so I've got 15 degrees of dead rise in the back and about 27 degrees dead rise in the front so it's a, it's a big boat uh, it's the video in the videos it uh, the camera really doesn't do justice to show actually how big and how long this boat is you know a 25 foot boat at least for the region that I'm in you know kind of this you know in the central midwest it's a that's a big boat you know especially for a fishing boat you know the majority of the boats are you know 1648s and 1860s and you know you have the odd 2072 around but to do a basically a 2584 that's a big boat uh so you know the, like i said the camera doesn't really do it justice on how actual big this this boat and this project was so that's kind of cool all right so a question that keeps coming up is uh you know what do i do for a living as far as you know am i a, a welder or a fabricator for uh, is that my job or career and in fact no no it's not i am a uh, i'm a carpenter by trade i've been in the trades for about 12 years now uh so you know yes and no i've kind of been around this stuff but i've always had a passion for welding and fabricating you know i bought uh bought my first welder whenever i was like 16 or 17 and you know i just been uh you know always into kind of the the welding and, and fabricating and making things of my own and this is by far one of the biggest projects i've ever taken on but uh you know it's it's not nothing that's uh you know gonna spook me by by any means so anyway i'm a carpenter that's that's what i uh you know i uh <laughs> I don't do deal with metal so much on a daily basis. It's more wood and wood and concrete. But uh, anyway, that's what I uh, that's what I do. Another question that consistently comes up 
is regarding the plans. Um, I can tell you right now, I have no plans. I had no plans for this boat. Matter of fact, I just, I grabbed this, this here. This is what I used to order all the materials of my boat. Uh, I had no plans except for I had once whenever I built this boat. Um, and doing it again, I would do it the exact same way. I absolutely had a ball building this boat and changing my mind all the amount of times that I did. Uh, you know, I started out with this boat, and funny story, I'll tell you, uh, I'll kind of go sidetrack here a little bit, but whenever I ordered the material for this boat, I had initially wanted to build somewhere around a, a 20 to a 21 foot boat. That was, that was what I wanted to do. Uh, I knew I needed over 20 foot just to be able to get the get out of the, the Coast Guard requirements, but 20 to 21 foot boat is what I wanted. So whenever I ordered the material, the, the big sheets of aluminum are actually pretty hard to find in my area. If I were down in Florida or over in Washington or somewhere around there, they'd be a lot easier to come by. So they're pretty hard to get. So I ordered my material and they showed up and they're 25 foot sheets. So I unload these sheets, these are very expensive sheets. I'm sitting there staring at them and I'm like, well, why well, chop four foot off of these things? Let's just build a 25 foot boat. So before I even got started building the boat, I changed my mind. And like I said, if I had a dollar for every time I changed my mind on this build, I could have paid for this thing five times over. Uh, you know, I know some people, uh, you know, they gotta go by plans, they gotta go by specs and everything else. And you know, I had an absolute ball just, uh, you know, Will this fit here? Will I make this fit here? How's this gonna work? I, I enjoyed I enjoyed the hell out of doing that. Basically what I had rather than plans is I had a list of needs. Um, I wanted a big tiller boat. Uh, I've had console boats, I've had tiller boats. I've, I've always been drawn back to the big tiller boats. I like the, the room that it gives you. Uh, even on a boat like this, you put consoles on it and you start necking things down and it, it fills up real quick. So I wanted a big tiller boat. I knew I wanted a, uh, a a bunch of different live wells, you know, smaller live wells for just day fish, and I wanted a big trophy box live well, uh, and I wanted uh, to be able to spider rig comfortably out of this boat. Now, for those of you who don't know what spider rigging is, spider rigging is, is a technique where you get two anglers that fit, one or two anglers that sit in the very front of the boat and they use very long poles. In my case, I use 16 foot rods. And you stick them out the front of the boat on rod holders and you spread them out in a manner that almost looks like spider legs. And you, you push or uh, you know suspend drift, basically minnows or jigs or crankbaits and you crappie fish that way. That's, that's spider rigging. Uh, so I wanted to be able to spider rig comfortably because the majority of the boats, whenever you try to sit two anglers up front, you can't turn, you're turning into each other, you're sitting right next to the guy, it's just very uncomfortable. So I wanted a lot of room in the very front of my boat. Secondly, I wanted room to where I could put those 16 foot rods, I wanted to lay them in the boat and I didn't want to have to use any rod holders that elevate the rods. I don't like those. And I wanted to be able to lay them down without having, without having to break the rods down every time I, I move or, or go fishing. So, you know, there's just a couple of different things that I, uh, honestly, that was honestly about it. Uh, I, I had a few set goals in my mind. So obviously with a, six, with a 16 foot rod, you need a long enough boat to be able to do that with the multitude of live wells and, and spider rigging. Uh, you know, I wanted a track system all the way through the boat, so where I do a lot of catfishing, so where I could either suspend drift or pull planter boards or anchor, or, you know, whatever. Uh, but I wanted a track system where I could move stuff around. I've never had a boat that's had a track system in it, so I, I wanted that. You know, just I just wanted a few little bits and pieces here, and what this created was this pretty actual, uh, pretty neat boat. So anyway. That's the plans. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I had no plans. I, I winged it, you know, as I went, and I, I really enjoyed that part of it. So anyway, uh, a lot of people wanted to know the uh, the type of materials that I used, as far as the the alloys and aluminums and things of that nature. So 
basically the vast majority of the boats that you see and by the way guys this boat is not a saltwater boat it probably will never see an ocean in its life so we got to kind of take that into consideration too i understand a lot of people see the see how big this boat is and, and maybe don't understand that i live in the central part of the country uh you know i've never seen the ocean in my life and this boat will probably never see the ocean so it's a freshwater boat so 95 percent of the boats that that you see around here uh you know the freshwater style boats are made out of a 5052 alloy aluminum it's a very workable aluminum it's all marine grade uh that being said it's fairly soft you know if you if you run up and hit a rock or you run up on a stump or a log or something there's a good chance that that aluminum may dent uh it's a softer aluminum then there's uh what you have a 5086 alloy so 5086 alloy is what a lot of your custom boat manufacturers around here make their duck boats out of. Uh, it's what a, a lot of the airboat manufacturers make it, their boats, their bottom of their hulls out of. 5086 aluminum is quite a bit harder. Uh, that being said, it's, it's a lot more brittle too. And being that it's so hard, it doesn't work uh, near as well as 5052 as far as, far as uh, bending it around and making curves and flares and things of that nature. So, you know, you kind of got the pros and cons of both. You can actually take a, a nail and you can scratch the 5052 aluminum. And then you can just have a piece of the 5086 right below it scratch with the same pressure and same depth and you will barely even glance uh, onto that 5086. It's actually that much harder. So what I did was I went kind of what I considered the best of both worlds. Uh, I put a 5086 bottom hull on this boat and I put 5052 sides on this boat. You know, if you bounce up against the boat dock, it's not going to have so much rigidity that it's going to want to crack. Uh, but at the same time, you've got the good, strong bottom of the hull. Uh, you know, like I said, this is my personal preference. Some may have went the 5052 throughout the whole boat and some may have went the 5086 throughout the whole boat. But that's, that's what I used. Um, as far as all the structural members, uh, you know, the square tubing and all the, uh, the other stuff and the trailer as well, uh, the vast majority of it all is 6061 material. So anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of what the materials used. Between this boat and trailer, I used just under 3,000 pounds of aluminum. Uh, so, you know, a pretty good amount of aluminum. My biggest problem with getting the aluminum is I built this entire boat and trailer uh, with two orders of aluminum. Uh, you know, every time I made an order, it was at least a four to five uh, lead, week lead time on this stuff. And like I said, it was very difficult to actually find the, the material that I needed, especially the big long sheets of aluminum. Uh, they were very difficult to come by. So, you know, that, that in myself, I kind of took a little bit of pride in the fact that I built a 25 foot boat from basically plans that I drew up or non-existing plans, however you want to call it. But I did it in two separate orders. Uh, so that was kind of cool. So another question that consistently comes up is uh, regarding the, uh, the longitudinal strakes that I put in the bottom of the boat. I, I put a two by four inch rectangular tubing in the very hull of the boat as stiffeners. So a lot of people noticed whenever I, uh, I, in the video, that they look like they're attached to the transom and a lot of people had concerns regarding that if water was to ever to get into the bottom of the hull, that it would never be able to make it down to the drain plug, uh, you know, because the, the longitudinal strikes, I have no gap in them. Well, as a matter of fact, what you guys didn't see in the video is I, I had thought of that myself and the the strakes actually are not tied into the transom at all whether that be right or wrong whatever but i actually left a gap of about an inch all the way through all all the members uh for the idea that you know if you get water in the bottom of a boat uh it's gonna eventually find its way down to the center not only that i did not weld these members in 100 percent and you know if there's one thing I've learned about water, if it has the smallest little gap, it will eventually find its way down to the center. So I've got no problems there. Uh, like I said, I left it an inch gap with the intentions of, of letting water flow. That being said, what you guys will see in future videos is that 
the, the top of the hull is actually welded 100% around with the idea that I don't want a lot of water getting in the bottom of the hull. I would rather keep it up high uh, due to uh, mold issues that I've always uh, had occur in other vessels. So anyway, that's the reasoning for the, uh, the longitudinal strengths. They are not tied into the transom. That being said, I've got 28 inch sides. I've got um, a massive storage compartment, a live oil compartment that all tie the transom in to the floor and tie it directly down to the bottom of the boat. So I've got no issues with the structural integrity of the transom. That's that. Uh, trailer axle positioning. That was another question that continually came up uh, whenever you guys saw me laying out my trailer. So a couple different things. I've built a lot of trailers in my time. Uh, you know, as far as axle positioning goes, you can fight somebody to death on, on the right way or the wrong way uh, of position. But one thing that you do have to take into consideration whenever you are talking about a boat trailer is that right here behind you, this is a 200 horse outboard motor. This is a six cylinder outboard motor. This motor weighs 700 pounds. Okay, now on your traditional trailer, if you think of a traditional utility trailer or something, the majority of your weight is going to occur right at the edge of the axles and forward or directly over the axles and forward. Whereas in a boat trailer, if you think you have a 21 foot boat, let's, or let's just use this boat for example, it's just a 25 foot boat. So I have a 25 foot trailer, meaning that the end of the trailer matches the end of the boat. Except for, in this case, you always have an outboard hanging off the back. And in this case, this outboard weighs 700 pounds. It's hanging off almost three and a half feet behind the boat. So realistically, you have to consider where the edge of the motor is, the back side of the motor, and you have to envision that as the end of your trailer. So if you place your axles, you know, three foot off the end of the trailer, and you add an additional three foot, you're six foot off the end of your trailer, realistically. The, yes, I know the motor ties into the transom and your waist distributed there, but at the same time, you've got all that weight hanging off the back of the boat. So you have to really take that into consideration. Uh, not only that, like I said, this boat, I, there's comparable boats, uh, you know, around here. Not quite this big, but you know, there's 25, 24 foot boats. I took a lot of measurements off of uh, boats that I've had previously, boats that, you know, are comparable in size. And I just, you know, did, like I just said, I kind of figured in, this is a 700 pound motor. You figure two batteries and you know, all your other equipment, you've got damn near a thousand pounds hanging right off the last foot of the boat. You have to remember too, this is a, a tandem axle trailer. So realistically your front axle would be your main axle with your rear axle being more acting more like a tag axle. So, uh, you know, you've got to take that into consideration too. Um, like I said, I've, I've had no problems with the placement of this boat. As the boat sits right now, being almost complete, I've got just over 100 pounds of tongue weight, which is right where I want to be. This boat is going to be pulled with a three-quarter ton truck everywhere it goes. I would rather have a little bit more tongue weight than not on a, on a trailer this long. This, by the time you figure in the motor length of this boat, this whole rig is almost 35 foot long. So anyway, that's, that's kind of the... Uh, that's kind of the uh, the reasoning behind all that. Like I said, I had, I did have quite a few questions on that. So, next question is regarding the foam that I use. Now, I believe you guys have only seen me put this foam in the transom. You will see me in future videos put this foam all throughout the hull of this boat. So, one thing to consider is, and let me back up to another question before I talk about the foam is. Uh, licensing and Coast Guard issues and things of that nature. So with this boat being a homemade boat and it's over 20 foot long, this boat will not be Coast Guard approved per se. It will never have that sticker that you see, you know, the Coast Guard rating of so many pounds and so many people. Uh, this boat will be titled as a homemade commercial boat and basically that means that I don't have to play by the rules that the Coast Guard has to. It's kind of like putting D plates on a vehicle. Uh, basically what I what I have to do to get this boat licensed is after I get it completely finished I need to go take it to my local DNR uh, with documentation of materials pictures during the build things of that nature they will inspect it and they will give me a VIN number 
but it will never have that Coast Guard approval that you guys see, that big yellow sticker. So flotation is not really a concern in that manner. Uh, you could actually build this boat just a big hull with no flotation and it would be fine. Uh, that being said, I used the, this foam flotation as a flotation aid as well as a sound dampener. If ever you've been in a, you know, a, a smaller, cheaper aluminum boat that doesn't have any foam flotation in it, you'll know that those waves, even a small chop, will make a, almost an echo through the boat. It's very loud. And in a situation like I am with the with your spider rigging technique, you, I mean, in a lot of cases, I may be spider rigging in less than three to four feet of water. Uh, you know, you don't want that sound, that big beating sound at the bottom of the hull. So you put foam in there, kind of deaden the sound. So this is the foam. I kind of want to explain this. Uh, this is two inch rigid. Uh, it's basically house insulation foam. This is a closed cell foam. This stuff does not absorb water. Uh, you know, it's very durable. It's light. I'm not quite sure what a four by eight sheet of this stuff will float. This is all two inch what I put throughout this, this boat, but I've got eight sheets of this stuff throughout the boat. So that's a quite, that's quite a bit. I mean, in real reality, I mean, as far as, uh, you know, flotation, I, I feel like, I mean, uh, I don't have a calculator here to do the math real quick, but you can figure up, you know, the square footage of that and the foam. I know we used to use these on our, uh, on our flathead floats and I know it takes a big flathead to pull down even half of this size piece of a <laughs> piece of foam. So anyway, that's what I used it for. I used eight sheets. Um, as far as I've had people question about the heat versus, you know, cause I sandwiched a lot of it in. Uh, you can see if you, this piece here had a lot of spatter that dripped on it. And you can see it melted just slightly, but uh, you know, I've had no issues with this stuff just catching flame and burning up or anything. So anyway, that's the foam. Um, like I said, there are actually several manufacturers, uh, custom boat manufacturers that use this as a flotation aid. It's a closed cell foam. I didn't want to spray in foam to any of this boat. I've actually seen older boats that the foam for whatever reason starts to uh, react with the aluminum and kind of kind of corrode so uh you know this is all it's all tied in into the bottom of this boat that's what i used uh you know whether it be right or wrong that's what i did another issue is or another uh concern that you guys voice opinion is the corrosion issue now you know as i said before this is a freshwater boat uh you can beat this horse to death with, uh, you know, you eventually, eventually you're going to have stainless that comes in contact with your aluminum. Eventually you're going to have some sort of copper that comes in with your aluminum. Uh, you know, eventually you're, you're going to have something corrosive that comes in contact with something else. It's just going to happen. Uh, you know, as far as now I'm not putting a bunch of mild steel laying it all, you know, unpainted in this boat. But that being said, as far as the bunks go, yes, I used, uh, you know, treated bunks on the aluminum. You know, there's thousands and thousands of boats out there that are, you know, doing the same thing. And they've been around for 30 plus years. Same as the motor. I mean, you can argue to death that the motor, you know, versus the, you know, the stainless bolts that hold the motor on going through the aluminum. That's a corrosion issue, you know. And so, you know, like I said, you can beat that. Uh, horse to death on something like that, but I did try my best. This whole boat is all aluminum. Uh, you know, there's not one piece of wood in here. Yes, I use some stainless in places, uh, you know, and my latches and other things, but you just, you can't get away from that. As far as the bunks go, you guys saw me use two by four bunks on the trailer. Now I used four of them, uh, 16 foot long. So I've got a lot of surface area there. And some, some questions were, why didn't I use two by sixes? So, I've never built a boat this big and I've never had a boat this heavy either. I've always had aluminum boats. I've never had a, a boat this heavy. With this boat being so long, I wasn't sure how it was going to come off the trailer. You know, some of our boat ramps that I use are, uh, you know, very steep. So what I did was I used two by fours in case that I can't get the boat off the trailer with just the bunks. It has a hard time. So I can additionally add rollers to this boat. And if I don't even add them on, on boat or on all four bunks, so I just put them on two and then build the bunks up, I can, I can do that. I have that option. But the rollers that I would use actually slide over top of a two by four. So 
I was just kind of building a safety just in case. Like I said, I, I've had this boat on the water one time as a leak test and that was like five months ago. So for four months ago or whatever. Uh, so once I start using this boat consistently, I'll better understand, uh, you know, how I want to go about, uh, you know, using the bunks. And I can always change them if the boat comes off real nice and smooth and I end up liking the look of two by sixes. I've got the room actually, uh, you know, on the supports that I could just tear the, the two by fours off and put two by sixes on. So that was another question that, you know, you know, came up. Uh, one final question here and then we'll, uh, we'll move over and I'll show you the welder. Uh, but regards the motor, so uh, if you guys can see here, let me see if I can move the camera a little bit. So anyway, uh, this is the motor that I ended up going with. You guys have heard me say I, I am not putting a kicker motor on this boat. Uh, I'm using this, this one big main motor. If ever I do want to uh, use a kicker motor, I have basically built in a way that I can have a kicker motor here and use it. Uh, but so what I went with was this is a a Mercury uh, Verado. It's a six cylinder, two hundred horse supercharged motor. So uh, you know a lot of questions about what kind of motor you actually put on this boat since you have a tiller. So Mercury has a system where they have a basically a power steering tiller handle built into the motor so this this motor is actually controlled through an electric over hydraulic pump that actually works as a power steering system so you're not you know having the horse's whole motor over by yourself you know just with sheer leverage uh i went with this motor here i had a hell of a time getting it uh if i ever do something like this again i will not go with a mercury just simply because of the the customer service and the uh the dealers that i had problems with uh you know, I, this motor is actually, Mercury says that you cannot put this tiller handle on this motor. They say that the motor's too big. That being said, it's very, very common out west to do this. And uh, I just had a, I just had a time trying to get everything set up here. Uh, it, was, it was over five months I had to argue with dealers and things like that. So, like I said, I'll do more on the motor once it all gets set up and I get the power steering pumps and everything hooked up. Uh, I'll share with you guys the motor. But anyway, this it's a 200 horse supercharged tiller is what I ended up putting on this boat. Uh, well, I don't know quite what this motor is going to push this boat. It may be uh, it may be 35 mile an hour. It may be 52 mile an hour. But uh, you know, either way, I'm not too concerned with that with uh, you know speed. If I can do 30 mile an hour, then I'm I'm perfect in this boat. So anyway. That's that's the majority of the questions, guys. Like I said, I try not to keep this video too awful long, but uh, that's what I've got here uh, for you guys. So I've got the boat that's almost almost completed. I'll give you guys just a quick walkthrough, real quick. That way, you guys could maybe follow some of the things that I'm talking about better in the future videos. Like I said, we're about halfway, I believe, on the uh, you know on the build, and then we'll we'll take you over and uh, we'll show you you know about the welding setup i've got so anyway let me kind of do a quick walkthrough with you here so anyway we've got a the back compartment here which is the boat right there at the bucket where i'm sitting that's going to be the the rear seat pedestal the driver's seat so i've got a nice compartment built in right there that's going to house this actually this box of pumps that's the the pump for the the hydraulic jack plate as well as the power steering got a storage compartment here this is eventually going to get a plate built on uh welded on top and it's gonna ha i'm basically having an 18 inch wide splash rail uh you know which is kind of cool uh it's all going to drain backwards i've got an inch of fall from from right here to right there moving over to here we've got a uh a rear 18 gallon live well bait well with uh rounded corners so i put six foot wings on this boat they turned out real nice. Uh, I've got my command control center, whatever you want to call it right there. That's going to be where all my gauges are housed as well as my, my depth finder uh, in the rear of the boat. So I've got this track system that I keep talking about. I've built a track system in all the way around the perimeter of the boat. Really happy with that. Uh, we've got 10 inches, 10 inch wide uh, catwalks built all the way around both sides of the boat. You got three foot doors right there and right there that fold out for storage. Uh, additionally, coming over here, this is a six foot door that opens up. 
And there's 11 single rod tubes that go up into the front of the boat. I can actually fit a 14 foot rod in these rod lockers. Uh, and they're in this rod locker without breaking the rod down. So that's cool. Um, there's a piece of square tubing. I'm gonna fabricate up a whole bunch of vertical rod tubes and have them placed throughout the boat. Coming up to the lower, uh, lower casting deck here. This is a, a eight inch step up deck to the main casting deck right here is housing my fuel tank as well as there's going to be three batteries being housed there for the front trolling motor moving up to the front deck here this is the main front deck that i talked about this thing really turned out good i utilized all the space that i possibly could there's seven compartments in the front of this boat so i just kind of had i've just kind of popped the uh the doors open right now so where you guys can see the placement of them i've got one giant main live well here storage compartment there there and there uh, anchor storage very forward there and then a uh, small live well right there uh, seat pedestals are going to end up going right there right there and right there so anyway i'll just kind of walk you through here uh you know this is the main main big live well here uh the box if you fill it completely full will hold 84 gallons uh to the overflow is just over 64 gallons so a massive live well here as well as a large storage place like i said before got storage there let's go all the way down to the bottom of the boat it's a nice big storage area here storage here as well uh, let me see here let me pop this lid open here if i can I don't have latches yet on this uh, on this particular compartment, but we've got a big main storage box right there. That's all aluminum built in, welded in tight so where you can throw a big anchor there and not have to worry about it beating on the bottom of your boat. And then right here, folding backwards, here's where I can access it with my spider rig and lock rod uh, is a 14 gallon live well bait well with rounded sides also um, so anyway like I said that's that's the boat like I said that's the completed boat um, or basically the completed boat like I said I've got just a few things a few odd things left to left to finish <laughs> but uh, the majority of it is is completed so it's very cool. It's been a long project. Uh, you know, there's a ton of this boat that's just custom to a degree that you would never find, you know, on a commercial available boat or commercially available boat. So that's really cool. So anyway, guys, I'm going to take you over here, uh, get set up and I'll show you my, uh, my welding setup, and we'll, uh, we'll finish out this video. Pulled the welder out, out of the corner there. So where you guys can get a little better look at it. Uh, so this is the welder that I'm running here to run my spool gun. This entire boat uh, has been welded up with this spool gun right here. Uh, I'm running one pound spools. So these are old school welders. Uh, you know, not digital. There's one little bitty circuit board on this thing that runs these all these welders. The transformer in this thing is giant. Um, they're, uh, you know, these things are old school. They're heavy. Uh, they're built to last. So these are naturally all, uh, you know, 220, 220 big welders. This particular one right here is a, uh, a Lincoln Ideal Arc DC 250. Uh, so this is a, uh, this is the welder here. I run, uh, my MIG setup as well as my spool gun off of this setup here. So what I've got here is this is the main power unit. And then I've built this uh, rolling carrier here for my uh, wire feeder there for my MIG gun, as well as my control module you can see down there for my spool gun. Uh, I've got 50 foot of lead off the back of the welder so I can wheel this thing around anywhere I want. And I've got 25 feet of... Uh, of lead on the spool gun so I can be a ways away from this power unit here and still get the job done. Uh, this is not a pulse MIG system. 
there is uh, like two settings <laughs> as far as being able to, to control. You've got a voltage and that's, that's about it. Uh, so you're welding this with a spool gun, you're welding this aluminum with DC, uh, DC voltage, whereas with a TIG unit, you know, to weld aluminum, you need AC. These welders are everywhere. They're, they last forever. Uh, you know, these are, these are under $1,000 you can pick these suckers up. And like I said, I highly recommend them. The spool gun that I'm welding with here, this is the, the Lincoln. Let's see if it'll focus on that. This is the Lincoln Magnum SG spool gun. This is more of your uh, industrial uh, kind of application spool gun. This isn't the little cheap $200 ones you see at the store. Uh, you know, welding this 3 16 aluminum, there was a lot of times I had this sucker cranked up to 24 volts. And uh, I don't believe that I think you'd burn up them cheap little spool guns. I, I just think they'd, they'd melt right in your hand. Um, so anyway, I've been very happy with the setup. I've been running it for, like I said, a long time. Uh, done a lot of projects with it. So anyway, it's nothing fancy at all. Uh, you know, it's old school analog stuff and it, and it works. Um, like I said, the spool gun, uh, you know, all this, the spool gun and the control module cost uh about three times is what i paid for this the power source the welder but uh you know you gotta have it um the spool gun i like the spool gun the only if i had to critique it uh the grip on this spool gun you can see that compared to my hand it's uh it's pretty beefy and if you're doing a lot of welding with this thing your hand will get fatigued after a bit just from the awkward grip uh, but other than that, it's held up real well. Uh, the drive rollers in the sucker have worked real well. Uh, I've ran, I think, right now between the trailer and the boat, I'm at, I think, 68 or 69 spools of aluminum through this thing, and I've had one bad spool uh, out of that. And I'm not even sure that was the, the gun's fault. That I think that was the way the spool was wrapped. So, you know, uh, very good unit here. So we'll come over here. This is my other unit here. This is uh, this is the unit that I TIG with. This is basically the same unit. Uh, it's an Ideal Arc TIG 250. This is a high frequency AC machine. So where I can TIG with uh, I can TIG TIG aluminum. It's got the high frequency setting on it. So. It does a real nice job of, of welding too. Like I said, these are all uh, these are all old school machines. They're not digital. You just gotta weld with them. Like I said before in the other videos, you're not gonna get that roll of nickels every time with these, just because of the constant voltage. Uh, you know, it doesn't pulse. That being said, I've built a boat and it's watertight. You know, so it doesn't take uh, you know it doesn't take a ten thousand dollar machine to do this kind of stuff. So anyway, like I said, uh, doing this kind of stuff, I've had a lot of people ask about the welders. I would definitely not use, you know, anything less than, uh, less than the size of a welder. Uh, this welder here, it's 65 volts max and it's a 50% duty cycle at 30 volts. Uh, so that duty cycle is super, super important whenever it comes to welders uh, like this. And I've, I've been burning a long time with this and I've never, I've never hit the duty cycle, you know. As well as where I am out here, uh, you know, I have to have all single phase equipment. So, you know, no three phase for me. So anyway, like I said, I hope that clears up, uh, clears up a few things on the, on the welder setup. I'm running nothing fancy. Simple spool gun, old school welder, and uh, you know, it gets the job done. So that's my welding setup, guys. Like I said, it's nothing fancy. I've had that welder. I think I bought it whenever I was 18. Uh, I've had it for quite some years now, going on 10 years now. So, uh, you know, those are the style of welders that, you know, are still available out there for very little money, uh, you know. The, that whole setup, you know, the, the power unit anyway, you know, you're looking at less than $1,000 for those, you know, you can buy them all day long. Uh, and no, you're not going to get the, uh, 
basically the the settings and and you know fancy performance that you will of like a pulse mig gun or a uh, you know your ten thousand dollar <laughs> basically you know digital units um but what you've got is you've got the heavy duty cycles and you've got the simplicity of it there's one circuit board in both those welders it's about that big by about that big and that's all that controls it uh you know it, it's old school it's analog and it works the sucker fires up and it runs and like i said it's got that heavy heavy duty cycle uh you know that you need for whenever you're really burning a lot of metal quickly so yes there are some cheaper welders out there that have all the fancy settings but you know like i said before you really need to look at those duty cycles uh because you can have all the settings in the world and if you can't weld for more than a minute at a time you know you're gonna be a long time doing something so anyway not saying that those are the best in the world by any means uh not at all like i said if i had my my preference i would own one of those ten thousand dollar machines you know no no questions asked but uh you know for what i for what i've done with this boat here i'm, I'm completely happy and all my other welding projects uh you know i've been using those those two welders for a long time now uh and you guys can see what you can create with with a smaller or you know with a welder like that uh it doesn't have to be anything fancy as far as the spool guns go like i said uh spool guns great you just have to kind of plan out you know in the tight places because it is such a uh, awkward gun compared to your regular like MIG style torch. Uh, so anyway, that's my welding setup. Like I said, I didn't want to harp on it too much because it's nothing fancy, uh, you know. But I have had a lot of questions about that and what my setup is. Uh, if I if there's still a bunch of questions and, and concerns about that as far as settings and everything else, I will do another video just on that. But uh, you know, like I said, guys, I just wanted to do this video. I tried to keep it as short as I possibly could, but I wanted to cover, uh, you know, some of the questions that continually come up. Uh, so anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it uh, interesting. Hopefully it answered, you know, some of the questions or concerns that you had going into it. Uh, like I said before, one of the biggest things is the plans and the structural integrity of this boat and everything. And you have to remember this boat is made out of 3 16th material. Uh, it's a beast. So, anyway, guys, I uh, <coughs> hope you enjoyed. Until next video, we'll see you guys.